Hi, it's Dr. McLaughlin with a video review on how neurons work. So a couple of disclaimers and kind of what this video is about. Big question, of course. Um, the things on this video, are they going to be on the test? Well, yes and no. They're not going to, there's not going to be any new information. The purpose of this video is not to throw a bunch of new information at you outside of class that you're going to be tested on. The purpose of it, though, is to help you study chapter three in your textbook talking about um, basically how the nervous system works, how neurons work. I talk about it a little bit in class, but I really sometimes kind of speed through it because I'm trying to get to the parts where we talk about neurotransmission and the different neurotransmitters, assuming that you've gotten some of this stuff in your introductory psychology class where you're really supposed to learn about dendrites and axons and those kinds of things. So the point of this, um, there's not going to be anything uniquely on here that's going to be on a test. But of course, anything I say in lecture is fair game for a test, and I do talk about how neurons fire a little bit. It's also fundamental to understanding everything in the rest of the class from here on out going forward. So it's probably a good idea for you to use this to help you study, to queue up different sections of it, because it might run a little bit long. So that way you can review different parts of it. Um, that way if I kind of say something a little quickly or I gloss through something, for instance, by talking about an action potential and saying, um, an action potential happens when positivity enters the cell. And if I say that kind of quickly and you're kind of thinking, well, what does that really mean and how do I picture it? Well, that's what this video is here to do. It's to kind of take a step back and explain what those concepts are and show you kind of how it all works. And hopefully you can internalize that and picture the whole process a little bit better. So that's really what this is about. So neurons are cells. That's a um, really important thing. Cells are the building blocks of all life, and they have different functions around the body depending on what organ they make up. In the brain, um, the important players are the neurons, which are these cells that are designed to take in information, sometimes from our senses, but very often usually just from other neurons. They take in this information in their dendrites and in their cell body, also called the soma. Dendrites literally mean branches, so they branch out and they look for connections to make with other cells and they form those connections we call synapses. The soma can also make synapses, or cell, uh, cell body can also make synapses, but another important function that it has is one that we don't cover too much in this class. It contains the nucleus and the other cellular organelles that really keep the cell alive and going. So the dendrite and the cell body take in information and then the neuron processes that information, sort of, in a sense, thinks it over, and then once in a while transmits some information of its own down its axon, down sort of this long fiber that comes out. Usually a cell can have multiple dendrites, but usually only one axon, although as you can see, the axon can branch off. And it ends in these, what are called here, terminal buttons, but they're also called axon terminals, um, or presynaptic terminals. That's another name that you'll see very often. So, there, so the neuron is there using the dendrite cell body and axon, those three major divisions of the cell. The neuron is there to take in, process, and transmit information. And if you think about it, that's really what the entire nervous system is there to do. So here's one tiny little piece of the nervous system, the basic building block of the nervous system. But it kind of has the same function on a much smaller and simpler level as the entire nervous system. We have a nervous system to take in information from our five senses, from the things that we see and um, things that we read and people talking to us, process it, think about it, and then transmit that information very often to our muscles um, to move in response to whatever it is we've thought about or to talk or, or basically commit some other motor response to it. So that's kind of what the neuron is doing on a much smaller scale in a slightly different kind of a way. To a neuron, its movement, what it can do, how it transmits this information is using action potentials. Action potentials are also called nerve impulses. They're these brief bursts of energy where once in a while a cell that is usually at rest is going to send a brief burst of energy all the way down the axon to the terminal buttons or the axon terminals. And then from there, as we've talked about in class, the terminals will release neurotransmitter onto the next cell and the process will repeat itself. 
So let's talk about features of the neuron that allow it to transmit this information. An important thing to know is that this information is electrical in nature. So when it's sending a signal, it's an electrical signal. But it's not, an el it's not using electricity the way you usually think about it with wires. It's using electrochemical energy. It's using ions. Ions are just atoms, um, sodium, potassium are some very important ones. They're usually things that you take in your diet from eating minerals and, and salts and food and stuff like that. And they carry an electrical charge. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. And these ions are just kind of floating around in the water on the inside and the outside of cells. So all cells have water inside and water outside. And it's separated by a cell membrane. The cell membrane is lipophilic, which is a term we use to mean oil soluble. In other words, it's oily and oil and water don't mix. These ions, on the other hand, are watery. So they can't cross the cell membrane. That means normally the cell membrane is there to keep certain ions in and certain ions out, and they can't cross on their own. So we create an, a voltage, basically an electrical potential, just by where do these ions go? Do we have a lot of the positive ones on the outside and negative ones on the inside? In that case, then, there will be a negative electrical charge. There will be a voltage because the positive ions on the outside want to get in. So there's pressure there. There's a little bit of energy that the neuron can use to send a signal. And here's how it creates an imbalance. Here's how it creates that voltage, that gradient. It uses what's shown here, a pump called the sodium potassium pump. And what it does is, if you'll notice down towards the bottom of this pump, this big beam looking thing, there are binding sites, there are spots for sodium to attach to it. Sodium that's on the inside of the cell, three at a time, will be kicked out. If you look at the top, you'll notice there are binding sites for potassium. By the way, sodium is Na, potassium is K, if you haven't already figured that out. So these purple sodium that are inside of the cell, three at a time, are being kicked out. Every time that the pump kicks out three sodium, it's pulling back in two of the potassium. That's why what you notice is you get a lot more sodium on the outside, you get a lot more potassium on the inside. Another thing to take note of is there's an imbalance here. We're kicking out three positive charges and we're pulling back two. So that means every time this pump works, there's a net loss of one positive charge. So it's a plus three and a minus two. So the cell is losing one positive charge every time this pump works. And these pumps are all over the nervous system. They're all up and down the membranes of neurons and they're running constantly. They are also, this little explosion right in the middle, what that's there to indicate is this is an active process. In other words, you're using calories from the food you eat. A good significant portion of the caloric intake, the energy that you take in in your diet, goes to powering these pumps. So you're fueling these pumps constantly and what these pumps are doing is they are creating voltage. They're creating an electrical imbalance where you've got more positivity on the outside of the cell, literally more positive ions, than you have on the inside of the cell. That's creating an imbalance and sort of a pull because the positive ions, as I'll talk about in a moment, really want to get into the cell. So briefly, let's just introduce the ions we're going to be talking about. On the left side of the page are the ones, are the important ions in neurotransmission, in action potentials, um, and they are sodium, potassium, and calcium. All of these carry a positive electrical charge. Potassium, or sorry, calcium, as you can see, that's not a typo. It actually carries two positive charges. Where these positive charges come from is the fact that it's, the, it's just the relationship in that atom of the number of protons to the number of electrons. If there's one more proton than electrons, then you have a positive electrical charge. In the case of calcium, there are two more protons than there are electrons, so you have um, two positive charges. On the right-hand side of the page is the other way around. Cells that have more electrons than protons, so they carry a negative electrical charge. Chloride is going to be a very important one. We'll talk about this semester. Also, there are these proteins. Technically, proteins are not ions, because ions just refer to atoms, so individual atoms. A protein is a large molecule made up of a bunch of atoms, but still the point is it carries overall a negative 
electrical charge. So it's going to be a player here too. So here's the state of affairs for a neuron at rest. As we talked about, you have that sodium potassium pump that's constantly running and it's kicking sodium out of the cell and it's pulling in potassium. So if we look at all of these players, you've got these five different types of ions we've just discussed. And there's always going to be some on the inside of the cell and there's going to be some on the outside of the cell. But in different amounts, in different proportions, there's always imbalance here with each one of these. So for sodium and potassium, because of that pump constantly running, you have much more sodium on the outside of the cell and you have much more potassium on the inside of the cell. If you add all of these up with the pluses and minuses, there are special equations that people do. What you note is that you're adding together, okay, um, there's some positive ions on the outside, but there's some on the inside, they're, but they're balanced by negative ions on the outside and the inside. You add all that up and basically all of these positive and negatives are canceling each other out. What you discover is that the inside of a neuron at rest has more negative electrical charges than the outside does largely because of the sodium potassium pump creating an imbalance. Another thing that you note on this slide is that we've got that lipid bilayer, that cell membrane that is preventing all of these ions from, coming, from going in and coming out. Again, it's relatively impermeable. They can't just cross. So that's also going to create an issue because if sodium wants to get in, it normally can't get in when the cell is at rest. One major exception to this is going to be that embedded in the neuron's membrane are these ion channels. The ion channels are what we call transmembrane, which mean, means they bridge across the membrane. There's part of them that's on the outside of the membrane, and there's part of them that sticks to the inside. And they will allow, when they are open, a specific ion to get through. So these are very specific. In other words, there are potassium channels, actually several different kinds. There are sodium channels, there are calcium channels. Those channels really only let in that specific type of ion. When, those, when all of those ions are closed, as we mentioned, that neuron is going to have an ele a negative electrical charge to it. So these ions are keeping Sorry, the, these ion channels are keeping the ions out normally. But why do these ions want to move around so much? What's working on these ions and pushing them in one direction or the other, pushing an ion outside of a cell if it's inside, um, or maybe even holding a cell, a, an ion on the outside of a cell because there are forces that are holding it there. There are two major forces at play. The first one is called a, a diffusion force or a diffusion gradient or a concentration gradient which is just the simple idea that if you have a bunch of the same ion next to each other, they want to spread out. So this is similar to just putting cream in coffee. It's going to spread out. It's going to diffuse. So what this means is ions are not going to be, want to be around more of the same ion. They want to spread out. So that's pushing them out. So taking potassium as an example, what you notice is that when the cell is at rest, there is a potassium channel showing, showing kind of purplish red. There's a potassium channel that is normally open. And when it's open, you can see some potassium is leaving, some potassium is going into the cell. So you can see outside on the top of the cell in blue, inside the cell, um, down towards the bottom, down over here. So this diffusion force, what's going on? Remember that I said that because of the sodium potassium pump, there's lots of potassium, lots of Ks, lots of those sort of brownish yellow ions on the inside. So according to potassium's concentration gradient, potassium is going to want to leave the cell according to that concentration gradient. So that's a force that's driving it out of the cell. So if you open up a channel, um, some potassiums that are really close by to other potassiums, they're going to want to go through that channel. Some will stay, some will start to leak out a little bit. But you also have an electrical gradient, which is another force that's working on it, and that's basically the electricity. That's the simple idea that opposites attract in electricity. So in this case, potassium, because it carries that plus, it carries that positive electrical charge, it's going to want to be in an environment with a negative electrical charge. So that's why you're also seeing some of the potassiums going in. The electrical gradient 
is driving potassium into the cell. So that's why some of the potassiums will leave if you leave these channels open, but some will come in. They're going to leave according to their, diff their diffusion or concentration gradient, but they're coming into the cell along their electrical gradient. They want to be where it's more negative. On the other hand, and here's kind of a big thing, how about sodium? Well, sodium, which again is the one abbreviated NA, its concentration gradient is pushing it into the cell. There's so much more sodium on the outside of the cell, it really wants to get in the cell. Remember that the pump, that's where it's putting it. It's taking all the sodium and pushing it out. So the sodium really wants to get back in just because it's spreading out along the concentration gradient. And in addition to that, along its electrical gradient, it also wants to get into the cell, just like potassium does. It's positive. The inside of the cell is negative. When it's outside the cell, there's way more positive charges. It doesn't like that. It's repelled by them. It's drawn by particularly those, remember um, what the big black circles represent is these large proteins with this negative electrical charge. The sodium is drawn by those, so it's being pulled into the cell by both of the gradients. That's going to be really important because the fact that sodium is trying really hard to force its way into the cell um, that's going to become very, very important for how the action potential works. All of these forces together create a negative voltage. In other words, the fact that the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside, the fact that it has more of those negative ions compared with the axon, means that we can actually measure a voltage of minus 55 millivolts across the cell membrane. So it's got a voltage, just like a battery does. It's in millivolts. We're used to thinking of batteries in terms of volts. This is thousands of a volt, but that's each cell. You'll see a number minus 55. You'll see some other books where it might say minus 50 or minus 60. The point is it's negative, and it's kind of in that range. It depends. You know, Different people will, uh, in different texts and different sources, have different numbers depending on kind of the study that they're looking at. But they're all going to be about in that negative range, about minus 55 millivolts. So that's the voltage, or we also call it the electrical potential that each neuron has just by the fact that that sodium potassium pump is constantly kicking sodium out of the cell. It's throwing out three sodium and pulling in two potassium, so it's generating this negative electrical charge. That's basically charging the batteries of the cell, and it's running constantly. It's just doing this all the time. But usually the voltage doesn't just sit there at minus 55. Normally, what a neuron is doing at rest is it's receiving excitatory or inhibitory input from other cells. And the excitatory input, those are what I often refer to in class as the yes signals. That's telling the cell, yes, you should fire. Yes, have an action potential. The inhibitory signals are saying, no, don't do that. And they're actually working to prevent an action potential. And in the end is we, we'll see this whole concept of the neuron processing this information. What do I mean by processing or thinking about the information? The neuron is weighing all of these inputs, the excitatory ones versus the inhibitory ones. And if you get enough excitation, that cell will fire an action potential. Um, another term that we use is we say that excitatory events are depolarizing the cell. What that means is they're driving it back to zero. So to say that the cell is polarized means that it has an electrical charge. Um, right now, at rest, it's at minus 55. But if we make it less polarized, what we're doing is we're essentially adding pluses. We're adding positive numbers to that negative value. If you add positive numbers to a negative value, it gets closer to zero. So that's what's going on here. How do we add those positives? Well, if a channel opens that allows a positive ion to enter, so such as sodium uh, or calcium, or another situation that might work, but this really doesn't happen realistically. If a channel opened that allowed a negative ion to leave the cell, that would also basically make the cell more positive, depolarize it. In other words, drive it up towards zero. On the other hand, um, some of the inputs that the neuron can receive are no inputs. They're no signals from other cells. And no signals are going to hyperpolarize the cell. In other words, make it more polar. Drive that voltage down. Drive it down from minus 55 down to minus 60 or theoretically below that. 
When that happens, you're making the cell less likely to fire. What are events that cause that to occur? If, a pota if po more potassium channels open, potassium leaves the cell according to its concentration gradient. If a positive ion is leaving the cell, then the cell is getting more negative. Or if we open up a chloride channel, as happens with a very important receptor we're going to talk about, the GABA receptor, that makes the cell more negative because there's a concentration gradient pushing chloride ions, which carry this negative charge, into the cell. So those are different forces that are making sure that that resting potential, that minus 55, doesn't stay there. It goes up, it goes down. If it goes up by a certain amount, an action potential will happen. If a bunch of inhibitory events hyperpolarize the cell, it makes it very hard for that action potential to happen. And so these ion channels, what controls whether they open and close? Well, that's controlled by receptors. In many cases, the channels themselves are the receptors, so, rece so channels might have a binding site for a particular neurotransmitter, and in that case, the channel itself is the receptor. In other cases, what's going on is that the receptors are kind of their own thing, but they're chemically in control of the ion channels. And what controls the receptors? Drugs and neurotransmitters. So that's why we use drugs and neurotransmitters um, to basically keep the brain going and, and cause different things to happen, some good, some bad. Let's look now at a video of how this can occur. So what we're going to see is we're going to concentrate on this, on this neuron in the middle. It's kind of an amber-yellow color. You see that it's got an axon. And it's also got an amplifier, basically an electrical detector kind of, in the axon hillock. The axon hillock, for reasons that we'll get to, which is just really the point where the axon starts. Again, it's the part where the cell body starts to taper out and become the axon. It's called the axon hillock. That's the trigger region for the action potential. So what's going on is that if the axon hillock detects enough of a depolarization, in other words, gets enough of those positive ions right around the region of the axon hillock, then an action potential will happen. Um, if some positivity occurs, in other words, some excitatory events happen, but they're too far away from the axon hillock, nothing is going to occur. And you can see with this neuron, there are three other, four, or actually four other neurons that make a synapse on it. Three of them are shown in red, and they're excitatory, and one of them, shown in blue, is inhibitory. Now, what makes a neuron excitatory? It releases a neurotransmitter that binds to an excitatory receptor. So that's what does it. So for instance, glutamate is a, is a neurotransmitter. When it gets released, it binds to a receptor that opens up a calcium channel. And that makes the cell more positive. So that's what makes a cell excitatory. It really has to do with the function of the receptor that it activates. So putting it into motion right here, here's an action potential. Shown is that yellow flash of light that comes down. Um, neurotransmitters cross the synapse. And here again, what's going on is that the neurotransmitter release has led to some channels opening. And that let in positive ions. Or for the inhibitory one, it let in negative ions. One of the things to take note of is that none of these caused an action potential to happen in the yellow cell. You would have actually seen sort of a bright flash of light. It's not literally light, but that's how they're drawing it. A flash of light kind of moved down the axon of the amber cell. That didn't happen, meaning that one excitation that occurred was just not good enough to stimulate an action potential. Then the second thing that you saw was that inhibitory cell firing. Now, an inhibitory cell firing is never going to cause an action potential. That's the point. It wants to prevent one. In fact, in that graph in the upper right, what you see is that it caused what we call an IPSP, which basically is an inhibitory event. It made the inside of the cell more negative. So it's saying right here that resting potential is minus 60. I say minus 55. It doesn't really matter. The point is that the excitatory potential, when neuron labeled E1 fired, it produced a little bump upwards, up towards zero. When the inhibitory cell fired, it produced a bump downwards, and that made the cell less likely to fire that action potential. Another thing that you're going to take note of is, why do cells need all these different inputs? Why not just have one or two? 
Well, some of the inputs matter more and some matter less. And as a simple rule, the closer you are to the axon hillock, the more you matter, you being a, a, a cell that's trying to make a connection with this cell. So that neuron labeled E2, when it fires, each action potential really doesn't mean much to the axon hillock just because it's so far away. What's going to happen is that if all of these excitatory cells open up a receptor that lets in sodium or calcium, some other positive ion, well, some of that sodium or calcium is going to diffuse into the cell. It's going to hang out for a little while. It's going to start to spread out, and then it's going to get kicked out of the cell. It's going to, get fade it's going to start to fade away, as we'll see here. So let's watch here down E1. Here's an action potential. The axon hillock detects it, as you can see in the upper right. But here comes um, a second action potential down E2. It's really far away. So you'll notice in the second case, on the upper right-hand corner, how much of that positivity, how many of those positive ions actually made it all the way across the cell to the axon hillock? A lot fewer. That's why it's saying smaller EPSP. In other words, it just didn't detect that strong of a signal because that second cell is just so far away. So that second cell is way less likely, the one we call E2, that's way less likely to produce an action potential on its own just because it's so far from the axon hillock. So, of course, a cell that made a synapse right at the axon hillock would have a huge influence as to whether or not this cell fired. Now, look, a line has been added to that graph called the threshold. The threshold potential is the point that you have to reach at the axon hillock to trigger an action potential to happen. Um, you'll routinely see it described as minus 40, minus 45, minus 50. Again, it's in that range. The point, it doesn't matter what the number exactly is. The point is, it's a little bit higher than the resting potential. So the actual voltage of the cell, the actual potential, is going to bounce around kind of minus 60, minus 55. It's going to be in that range. But if it gets as high as the threshold, then an action potential will definitely occur. And it doesn't just have to get that high, it has to get that high at the axon hillock. So way out where E2 is making a synapse, way over on the left-hand side, that part might reach threshold, but that part doesn't matter so much. The threshold has to be reached at the axon hillock because that's where the action potential is triggered. That's where the chain reaction of the action potential actually starts. So what we're going to see is a couple of cases, a couple of things that can cause an action potential to happen. The first one is called spatial summation. In other words, two different, neuro, two different synapses in two different locations, two of these excitatory um, incoming neurons are going to fire right around the same time. And if they do that, what you're going to start to see, let me put it in motion, is that their positivity sums together. They're both letting in a good amount of positive ions, and there's the action potential moving down to the very end, and you saw it release neurotransmitter way over uh, on the right-hand side from its axon terminals. That's something we call spatial summation, summing like in math, like adding two things together. We're adding together the sodium ions from E1 with the sodium ions from E2. When you put them together, they combine their forces, and they produced a potential at the axon hillock that reached that threshold. And also look at the graph. How can we tell an action potential happens? Because it's shot all the way up. Action potentials are some, sometimes called spikes. And if you graph them out over time, they kind of look like a spike. Because very quickly, look what's going on. You're going from the threshold way up to the positive side. So for a split second, this neuron is turning from usually a negative environment to a positive environment with a lot of positive electrical charges. And then very quickly, that goes away and it gets back down to normal. That's an action potential. Very important thing to keep in mind as we're talking about synapses and neurotransmitter release. These action potentials are very brief. They're a quick burst, and then they're over. Similarly, what's going to happen is the neurotransmitter is going to get released, and then very quickly, by a process of enzymatic degradation or reuptake, the neurotransmitters are going to go away as well. Another important thing to take note of is that the purpose of that inhibitory axon coming in is to try and prevent the action potential from happening. And so the neuron does its quote-unquote thinking by weighing the positives and negatives, by looking at the yeses and the noes. So watch what's going to happen if you get not two excitatory cells firing at the same time, but an excitatory and an inhibitory input happening at the same time. They're going to cancel each other out. 
And if they cancel each other out, what that means is no action potential. You stay below the threshold. So that's really the function of inhibitory inputs. Here's something that can occur that can allow just one neuron to cause an action potential to happen just by its own excitation. So we don't just have to sum together different neurons. Sometimes one neuron's input can be so strong, it itself is firing a bunch of action potentials at a time, one right after the other. And the combined effect over time of these action potentials, look over on the left-hand side at E2. What you're going to see is a whole bunch of action potentials happened. It created so much positive input into the cell. So many positive ions were rushing in just by that burst of action potentials all happening at the same time that even though E2 is pretty remote, even though that neuron is very far from the axon hillock, if it really has something to say, if it is really excited, then what's going to happen is it's going to combine together those individual bursts that let in so much sodium all at once that it's going to trigger an action potential. We see that on the graph as it says summed EPSPs. In other words, each one of those little bumps that you see going from minus 60 on up to reaching the threshold, that's the influence of one of these action potentials. You add them all together, and they can cause an action potential to happen if they're close enough together in time. If they happen one right after the other, they can sort of add together. If they're farther apart in time, what's going to happen? One action potential is going to occur, and then the sodium that came in resulting from that action potential is going to fade away. It's going to go, it's going to disappear. So you really need these things to kind of happen close together in time in order to be able to add together basically combined strengths of the multiple action potentials that that cell E2 had. So kind of summing all of this up, usually the axon hillock is very quiet. It's usually about at this minus 60. But what it's constantly doing is it's weighing all of these different inputs that are coming together, the pluses and the minuses. And if the plus is, if it's getting enough excitatory ions coming in, enough sodium rushing in, enough calcium rushing in, as a result of these other inputs from these other cells, it'll fire an action potential. On the other hand, if it gets too much inhibitory input, too much potassium is leaving, causing it to become more negative, chloride is coming in, causing it to become more negative, then that's going to block an action potential from happening. So let's talk a little bit about what the action potential actually is. We talked about what generates it in pretty good detail. Well, again, we've got a threshold to reach, and that threshold is around minus 40 millivolts. Again, the point is it's a little bit closer to zero than the resting potential. So the resting potential, using that excitatory input, is going to get a little bit higher. In other words, less negative. If it goes from minus 55 or minus 60, all the way on up to minus 40, an action potential will be triggered. Why is it going to be triggered starting with that axon hillock? Because at the axon hillock is the part where you start to see voltage-gated sodium channels. Remember that sodium is all lined up on the outside of the cell. There's very little of it on the inside of the cell. Its diffusion gradient is pushing it into the cell. It wants to get in. Its electrical gradient is pushing it into the cell. And sodium can feel that pull, almost like uh, if you put two magnets near each other, the, the north part and the south part of a magnet, and you have a piece of paper in between, there's a draw there. They'll pull together. That cell membrane is impermeable to sodium, so sodium can't cross it, but it's thin enough that sodium can feel the pull of the negative ions on the inside. So at rest, you're going to have a bunch of sodium lining up on the outside of the cell. And at a moment's notice, if there's any break in that cell membrane, sodium will rush in. So that's what is going to produce the action potential. And these table-looking things that you can see right here, those are sodium channels. And they're voltage-gated, which means that what opens them? They're not opened by a drug. They're not opened by a chemical. They're opened by voltage. They're opened by positive voltage nearby on the inside. So if this right here were the axon hillock, if you get enough of that excitatory potential near the start of the axon hillock, that is detected by these sodium channels. That is going to cause that sodium channel to open. 
And what's going to happen then? Well, this is an animation we can put into motion, but hopefully you're thinking this through and you're thinking, well, okay, what's going to happen if that sodium channel opens is more sodium is going to come into the cell, and that's going to make this region of the cell more positive, and that's going to open this channel. So it's really a chain reaction, and this is actually, you know, kind of a drawing of how that looks. What's going on? at each one of these time points is that each sodium channel is opening. Sodium, here depicted as, you know, I guess that goldish color. Sodium is rushing into the cell. And when that happens, it makes the channel in front of that open. And when that happens, it makes the channel in front of that open. So each one of these sodium channels opens and then very quickly closes. It closes and actually goes inactive for about a second or two. Not a, literally a second, more like a millisecond as you can see. But that's what carries the action potential. Like I said, it's not like electricity which, where electrons are shooting down the axon. Actually, nothing is really moving from one side of the axon to the other. All that's going on is this chain reaction of each sodium channel is opening up the one in front of it. And that one's opening up the one in front of that. And that one's opening the one up, up the one in front of that. And so on. So that's what's triggering the action potential to happen. What this means, here's an important thing about action potentials. Once they start, they don't stop, unless you know, there are some severe drugs or injury on board or something like that. They follow what's called the all or none law. In other words, once the action potential is triggered, it goes all the way down the axon and doesn't stop. The neuron either fires, because the cell reached the threshold potential at the axon hillock, or it's quiet. Those are the two options. We always use the metaphor of it's similar to firing a gun. A gun is either firing or it's not. It's not in kind of an in-between state ever. So the neuron is either firing an action potential or it's not doing anything at all. When that action potential happens, again, it's because there is enough positive ions. The voltage is high enough right where that very first voltage-gated sodium channel is, and it opens. When it opens, now the voltage near the next so, uh, voltage-gated sodium channel is going to be really high. And it's going to open. And now the voltage near the next one is going to be high enough to open, and so on. That is propagating or carrying the action potential all the way down to the other side. Let's look for a moment at a graph of what's going on here. So again, sorry, we're messing with the numbers a little bit. Here, the resting potential is depicted as being minus 70, but there's also that little about sign. So about minus 70. Then here they say the threshold is about minus 55. So that's the threshold you've got to reach. There's that rising phase with the voltage. What's going on there? That's the point where sodium is rushing into the cell. Sodium is coming into the cell so fast in a matter of a thousandth of a second that all of a sudden it's completely flipped the voltage of that neuron. So that neuron has gone from something that's usually slightly negative at rest. Now we've shot past zero. So much of these positive ions, these sodium ions, are coming in that we reach plus 40. So that's the peak. It reaches plus 40 in a split second. And then it all goes away. You'll see there's that falling phase that seems to be happening even quicker than the rising phase does. The falling phase happens because now potassium wants out of the cell really bad. Remember before we said that potassium kind of wants into the cell. Um, it kind of wants to be in the cell along its electrical gradient, but it wants to leave according to its concentration gradient. Well, now what's going on is it's in a very positive environment. The inside of the cell is positive. Potassium is also positive. Like charges repel, potassium wants out of that cell. So at, right about at the same time these voltage-gated sodium channels open, voltage-gated potassium channels also open to hasten the exit of potassium. So potassium can now rush out of the cell, which very quickly brings the voltage way back down. It actually goes so far back down, it goes underneath the, the normal resting potential for about a split second. And then all the time, those pumps are pumping out that excess, so the, the excess sodium, and they're pulling in a little bit of potassium to sort of normalize the cell again. This just very quickly shows what action potentials actually look like. So just looking at the top trace right there, you can see that voltage normally going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the screen. 
it's going up and down a little bit. So that's the resting potential. Again, it's usually not a flat line at rest. There are inhibitory inputs and excitatory inputs. The inhibitory inputs are sort of driving that scratchy line up a little bit. The inhibitory inputs are pulling it down a little bit. But what you see about at the middle of the page is that you are getting some excitatory inputs that are so strong that they trigger not one action potential, but actually several in a row. It's a little bit blurry, but that's what you're kind of seeing there, is not one of these spikes, but a bunch in a row, just one right after the other. When a neuron wants to sell it, send a very strong signal, that's how it does it. It's using a bunch of action potentials fired one right after the other to send a very powerful signal if that neuron happens to be really excited. Again, it can't fire a stronger action potential. You can kind of see how high the action potential goes is always the same. So each action potential goes up to plus 40 and that's it. But you can have one right after the other in a burst that we sometimes call a tetanus. A tetanus is where you just have a burst of action potentials one right after the other. So it's almost like in an on and constantly firing state for a quick second. So now let's briefly go over a little bit of neurotransmission. Because we talk about this so much during the semester, um, I don't think we need quite the same kind of review, but kind of the story wouldn't be complete without talking about one important part of the story, and that's how does sodium come into the cell in the first place and create one of those excitatory potentials? How would chloride come into the cell and create a negative potential? So here comes an action potential, and then that's going to cause neurotransmitter release. And let's focus in on what's going on. You're going to see me draw axons like these. Obviously, I can't draw nearly as nice as this, but it contains a lot of the important things that we're going to draw, along with some other things that I might typically skip over. So you can see the presynaptic axon terminal at the top. It fits into a dendritic spine, which is sort of almost like the cup that it seems to be sort of attached to. Of course, it's not quite attached. There's a synapse in between. But you see the receptor proteins um, shown in light blue or light bluish green on the bottom in that postsynaptic membrane. Another thing that you see is calcium on the outside of the cell. This is something that I skip over in class, but it's an important tie between how an action potential works and how neurotransmitters get released. Now, let's say an action potential is going to come down. It would come down from the top. We're not going to see, of course, the axon hillock, but it would be coming down. And again, what's, what's driving that action potential is that sodium is rushing into the cell, and it's opening up other voltage-gated sodium channels. Well, when it gets down to the very ends, it's going to open up voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium, again, is another positive ion. Once that happens, and normally, just like sodium, it's outside of the cell. When that happens, what's going to occur is that calcium is going to come into the cell, and it's going to bind to a special protein on the vesicles. When that occurs, that's going to set into motion the process of drawing the vesicles down towards the cell membrane and releasing. What you just saw happen was that calcium initiated that cascade where proteins on the vesicle, pulled it down towards the cell membrane. It bound to the cell membrane, basically kind of like crashed into it and sort of became part of the cell membrane. Where did those two vesicles go? If you rewind, you can see they actually smashed into the cell membrane and became part of it. They just kind of opened up and in doing that, expelled all of the neurotransmitters out into the synapse where they can cross and bind to the receptors. In this particular case, these are excitatory receptors. They are a sodium channel. This neurotransmitter in this case is acetylcholine, which is a very important neurotransmitter, and one of its receptor types is excitatory, meaning that when acetylcholine binds to it, its receptors, this is actually what we call the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, yeah, named after nicotine. When it opens up, sodium comes into the cell and depolarizes that cell. In other words, for that tiny little chunk of the dendrite that you're seeing down at the bottom, in that particular region of the postsynaptic cell, it now has a higher voltage than it did a moment ago. And if it's very close to the axon hillock or that sodium is kind of combining forces with the sodium from other action potentials on other parts of the cells, as we saw in that previous animation, that will generate an action potential in the postsynaptic cell in the cell on the bottom. Then, of course, what's going to very quickly happen, as we talk about, is there are enzymes. 
Here enzymes are shown in blue and they're just constantly within the synapse and they're going around and they're destroying acetylcholine. Sometimes what can also happen at this sometimes within the, the very same synapse is that transport is happening. Transport, we also call reuptake, it's really doing the same thing, kind of doing the same function as the enzymes were, and that is clearing out the synapse. So neurotransmitters are now gone out of the synapse, and they will be packaged back into the vesicles, and we're ready to go again. So the neuron is creating more vesicles out of its cell membrane, which is where, where they all end up after vesicular release. And now, if you'll notice, we're at the exact same point we were where we started this animation. Neurotransmitters are out of the synapse. They're all packaged in the vesicles and ready to go. Similarly, at the end of the action potential, um, all the sodium is going to get kicked out of the cell. Potassium is going to get pulled back in by those pumps. And once again, we're ready to go. We're back at, at, we're back at rest. We're back where we were at the very beginning. Now what I'd like to do is kind of draw the camera out a little bit. So we've been focusing on, on uh, these as, these neurons as kind of individual things. But they, of course, cells, like all cells, they make up tissue. They make up organs. They make up the brain in particular. Now, here's a slice of the brain. And what you can see is that there's kind of two colors going on. One is gray, um, way in the middle, and also mostly on the outside. So this is what we call a section of the brain, a coronal section, where we just slice somebody's brain kind of lengthwise, kind of from ear to ear. And what you see if you look inside, we usually talk about the brain being gray matter. Well, the gray matter doesn't go that deep. The gray matter only goes maybe a quarter of an inch or so. Beyond that is what's called white matter. Well, the dendrites and the cell bodies, what we refer to as the, as all, along with the axon hillock, what we refer to as the input zones of the cell, they make up the gray matter. If you look at those parts, they look gray. They all tend to cluster together. So you will have a bunch of cell bodies and dendrites sort of grouping together. When you get a cluster of these cell bodies and dendrites that kind of have the same function, they're in the same area, and they all are, are doing similar things, that's called a nucleus or a ganglion. So an example of a nucleus might be the amygdala, which you might have learned in some of your classes, is important for emotions. So the amygdala is a nucleus. In other words, if, you, if we were to look at this under a microscope, picture you know, just tiny little cell bodies with the dendrites sticking out all right next to each other, making up, kind of communicating with each other, all making up the amygdala. Out in the cerebral cortex, you might have some cells, um, some of which have very short axons. They're really talking to cells very close by. Some of them, on the other hand, talk to cells on the other side of the brain. And that's where this white matter comes from. The white matter that you see in the middle, really a good chunk of the cerebral cortex, is just axons going back and forth. When you have a group of axons that run together from one part of the brain to the other, or maybe from one part of the brain, down, to a, down your spine uh, and move your muscles, or in the other direction, maybe from your eyes or your skin, sending in sensory information. That's called white matter, and, and when you have a group of them together, that's often called a tract or a pathway. Or if it's a bunch of axons traveling together out in your arms and legs, that's called a nerve. That's what a nerve is. It's just a bunch of axons that are all kind of traveling together to the same point. So you might have cell bodies and axons, cell bodies on the left side of the brain doing some thinking, and some of them have pretty long axons that stretch all the way maybe to make a synapse on a cell on the other side of the brain. So that's one way to picture it. Um, so that we talk about the input zone, the dendrites, the cell bodies, the axon hillocks, usually all around one another, very close by, doing all the thinking. And then from any given nucleus in the brain, there will be one or more tracts or pathways that go in and come out and communicate with another important part of the brain. So I hope this has kind of made some sense of all this stuff, helped you understand sort of what an action potential really is, and also helped you understand how to put these neurons in the context of making up the brain, um, maybe even 
help you understand a little bit, maybe picture in a little bit better about how the brain does its thing using these tiny little action potentials. Again, the brain has 100 billion neurons, each with an average of 1,000 synapses. You put all that stuff together, so all these processes I've been talking about going on at the same time, that creates um, really all of who we are. So I hope this has been helpful. And um, again, uh, keep in touch with me if you want to talk about this or whatever else. And good luck.